Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over a 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This is Climate Justice, y'all. A podcast dedicated to lifting up and centering the climate and environmental justice movement in the South. Despite the South being the most biodiverse, diverse, and one of the largest economic engines in the world, we are underfunded and often barred from the decision-making table. Because of that, we decided to pull up a chair and amplify the stories of communities in the South that are hit the hardest by the climate crisis. We're using good old-fashioned storytelling to shine a spotlight on these Southern leaders from all walks of life, putting in their blood, sweat, and tears to transform the region. The usage of y'all in the title is on purpose. We are honoring our Southern heritage of creativity, resilience, and ingenuity. Climate justice, y'all. It's real, it's here, and it's about time. Y'all hear what we have to say. Hey y'all, I'm your host, Marisha Malcolm, and I'm joined with the fabulous Abigail Franks. Did you know banks invested over $673 billion on fossil fuels just within last year? When you think of adapting to the climate crisis and the need for banks to put that investment elsewhere, most people don't think of how satellites can play a huge role in the movement towards divestment. Today, we are bringing in geospatial scientist Ankur Shah with Climate Engine and Mycelium in Huntsville, Alabama to discuss how technology and finances are a vital part of the solution to the climate crisis. Climate justice, y'all. It's real, it's here, and it's about time we listen to folks like Ankur Shah. All right, let's get started with the show. Hey, y'all. My name is Marisha Malcolm. I'm the co-host, and we have Abigail Franks with us, and she's the host. And today, we are joined here with Ankur Shah, please let me know if I'm saying your name right. So, yeah, yeah, you, uh, Ankur Shah, you said it, you said it pretty accurately. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're just going to start off with you introducing yourself. Who are you? What do you do in this line of work? Yeah, just give us a little bit of information. Sure, sure, happy to. And first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and thanks for inviting. Um, so yeah, my name is Ankur Shah. I am currently a geospatial data scientist at a startup called Climate Engine, which is a climate tech startup focusing on um, financing and enabling the financing of climate adaptation and mitigation. And we do that by creating custom platforms using geospatial data to mostly serve institutions, uh, whether government, nonprofit, or commercial and financial institutions like banks to help them uh, navigate how they can uh, use finances and make decisions to enable climate mitigation and adaptation. And I'll get more into that. Then I'm also the director of operations for a nonprofit that's based out of Huntsville, Alabama called Mycelium. And Mycelium focuses on accelerating the circular economy using open source technology. And our aim is to enable open source solutions for waste management, food resilience and food sustainability, and also self-sufficiency when it comes to housing. Um, and lastly, I am really passionate about environmental education. My background's in physics and environmental science. And uh, I have a small YouTube channel that focuses on environmental issues and climate education. So that's an outlet for me to create videos on things I work on. Do you sleep, Anker? <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, I, I do. I do sleep, um, thankfully, yes. Yeah, well, okay. First of all, you, you kind of threw me off with a geospatial scientist. Could you explain oh my God. what that means? Abby. I mean, you literally took the words out of my mouth because I was like, you have this dope title that I've never seen before. What exactly is it? <laughs> it, it just sounds cool. Um, so basically, geospatial data scientists, it's, it's combining environmental science with data science. And specifically, the data type of data that I work with is satellite data. So geospatial, as the name implies, geo, earth and spatial. So it's like not just point data necessarily, but it's a part of it, but also like spatial data, which is um, cover like maps and, and TIFF files that cover large areas, even countries or global scale data. And um, 
what we do is use satellite data, uh, which are mostly publicly available like uh, from sources like NASA, European Space Agency, um, even some commercial ones like Planet. So these satellites are orbiting the Earth and collecting data on um, ve vegetation, on temperature, weather patterns, precipitation, all these climate variables also, and also monitoring our environment um, for issues like deforestation, water quality, air quality, so forth. And so, yeah, my day-to-day my -day job is basically um, doing part, like partly reading and doing research on um, techniques to monitor our environment and uh, climate, um, and also using the data, using uh, coding algorithms to figure out how can we as a company use this data to make it actionable uh, for institutions that we work with. Wow, 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 wow. That's really, really, honestly, when thinking about dealing with the climate crisis, I did not even consider this type of work, but I think this type of work is going to be so crucial and transformative um, when it comes to dealing with the climate crisis. Because you talked about using geospatial um, data to map out like climate risk and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. We're going to put a pin in that because I need to ask this question before I forget, before we go down the rabbit hole of um, learning more about uh, climate engines and things like that. But you mentioned earlier a circular economy. Um, one of the reasons why we brought you in here is because we want to talk more about circular economies and how finances really plays into the climate crisis and things like that. So can you explain what a circular economy is? Sure, sure. Happy to. So before... We go into the circular economy. For me, what helped was understanding what our economy currently is, which is a linear economy. And that's one in which we extract resources from the earth usually, or the ocean, and and extract resources, create new products out of those resources, and then we use them, and it's usually going to waste somewhere in a landfill or burned or somehow just not repurposed or recycled. And when we look at natural systems like a forest, for example, we see that um, when trees grow, the leaves and the leaves fall off. They fall onto the soil, then they decompose used by bacteria, fungi, and so forth. And those nutrients are returned to the soil. The nutrients then are absorbed by other plants, which are eaten by animals. And, and the point is that in nature, there's no such thing as waste. Waste is wasted resources when it comes to natural systems because our earth has evolved in such a manner. But when we think about human created systems, human created economies, um, we are living in a linear economy where we take products, um, make things and then uh, waste them usually. So a circular economy is one which essentially mimics nature where waste is repurposed, either recycled, reused or uh, made into its um, building blocks and recreated. And yes, there's loss of efficiency every time we do that, but we need to think about ways in which we can be as circular as possible in, in our industrial society. Mm, that's really, that you know, you said that and that just actually makes a lot of sense. And I'm surprised that we kind of don't do that already because I almost feel like if you're able to reuse something over and over and over again, like wouldn't you save money in the long run? Is that a silly question or? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, absolutely. So, for example, let's just take a quick example of a plastic water bottle, right? Um, let's let's take uh, like two people. One drinks from a plastic water bottle uh, or buys a new plastic water bottle every day, and the other uses a reusable water bottle uh, every day. And you can just imagine the reusable water bottle may cost like ten, fifteen dollars, but buying a plastic water bottle for Every, uh, each day of the year, that's going to be almost uh, like quite a bit, like uh, maybe less than hundred bucks. So, so you're saving money in the long run by using something that's initially expensive but reusable, and um, definitely better for the environment because less waste is created. Yeah, and then if the water bottle, the reusable one, was then processed in a way that the plastic could be reused to make another water bottle, that would be like the full cycle, right? Or using that something in something in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if the plastic bottles are recycled into new ones, that is creating less waste. But um, but again, like the hierarchy of a circular economy is reduce um, in the sense that reduce things that we don't need or, or at least reduce single use items. 
Um, and then if you cannot reduce that, then reuse it. And if you just cannot re reduce or reuse, then recycle it. So recycling would be at the bottom and then our priority should be reduction of consumption, then reusing of things we do need. And then, then if nothing, recycling. So now I'm thinking about like the finances of this and, and how does finance play a part in the circular economy? And more so, how does banks, how do they play a role in the circular economy and even the effect on climate crisis? So what would a, you, what? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh yeah, that, that's a, a huge question. So my work involves uh, like enabling financial decisions for climate adaptation and mitigation. The circular economy part is different at Mycelium in the sense that we just create solution, or we just create projects that are replicable and easy to do by anyone around the world. And um, so as far as that goes, um, it, it, here's the model we follow at Mycelium. We get money for a project, um, for example, the farm bot project that you saw, that's an automated raised bed. Um, using a robot on top of the race bed. We get money for doing that. And then we spread the word to, we are partnering with schools to do that. So we we um, have three schools that are ongoing and finishing up this farm bot project for their own students. And then once those are done and working and running, we will then tell other schools like, hey, we did this at uh, these schools. Do you want this? Do you want this cool uh, thing? Do you want uh, students to learn STEM education, robotics and also grow food? And the idea is to create really good examples that are replicable and um, doable by institutions, whether it's schools, universities, um, e even banks, although we haven't worked with banks directly yet at, at Mycelium. Um, that's the idea to to just showcase examples which can be done because we're not going to be able to do things on a global scale but we can inspire people to take up these projects on a global scale and that's the idea and it's it's mimicking mycelium which is the nature's biological internet um mycelial networks are within soils through which mushrooms emerge but they also enable communication between trees and exchange of nutrients so our idea, uh, our, our philosophy is exactly that, like exchanging ideas as a mycelial network um, focused on open source solutions for circular economies. Wow. That, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just kind of like blown away a little bit. That's really, really, really amazing. And, you know, thinking about, God, I just keep thinking about how this, adapting to the climate crisis in general is just going to be such a huge financial lift. Absolutely. And, yeah. And that's why we really, really need banks to get involved with this as well, because like I know, like if I'm not mistaken, some of some banks actually invest in fossil fuel and yes, and do Absolutely. come on, Abby and do that's but that's scary. And so like that kind of that's what makes me think about like how do roles or sorry, how do banks play a role in this uh, crisis? It's because they're financing it. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So many banks finance uh, the fossil fuel industry. In fact, I'm just looking up the latest statistic and banks all over the world, mainly they're the, the like main four, like JP Morgan Chase and those uh, so forth. But overall, totally banks provided six hundred seventy three billion dollars to finance uh, fossil fuel industries. And that's as of twenty twenty two. Wow. So, yes, banks enable. Um, you know, subsidizing of fossil fuels uh, and so forth. But on the flip side, like my work at Climate Engine, what we're trying to do is uh, twofold. One is uh, enable the transparent data-driven um, visualizations and data platforms of climate risk. So that involves uh, drought risk, wildfire risk, heat, extreme heat risk, and uh, extreme precipitation risk and flood risk. So. All these uh, hazards that are driven by climate change, we're creating products to visualize those in the short term and the long term. Long term meaning uh, until 2050 and 2100, short term meaning within the next few months or the next year. And the idea there is to one, um, let banks know how their assets are affected by climate risk so they can adapt if they have real estate properties or farms that they're loaning or owning, then they want to see what is the climate risk to that so they can um, make better decisions as to whether that's resilient in the long term because our food system depends on it, our um, economies depend on it and so forth. 
But the other flip side that we just discussed is, okay, how are how is the money by banks impacting the environment and impacting climate change? Um, because they can the, the financing by banks can lead to deforestation, uh, they can lead to excessive oil drilling. You, you already know about fossil fuel subsidizing. So what we're trying and mining. And so what we're trying to do is make transparent how bank money is funding, let's say, X companies um, and what those companies, what they're doing uh, to the environment. So we're, we're looking at like mines, um, oil refineries, all these assets that are owned by banks and then seeing their impact. So that's the next step. First step is what is the climate risk? Well, first step is answering the question, what is the climate risk to your assets, to banks? Second step is how is your money impacting the environment and climate change? And, and then third step, uh, which is an extension of the second one is what can they specifically do? What can banks specifically do to mitigate and adapt? So an example, easy example to understand this is um, we are looking into products that can map solar energy potential in cities, right? Wait, 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 you're, you can okay. map out social, you can map out solar potential in cities too. Like you can. Sure. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, there's satellites which have, which measure solar radiation and, um, okay, and you can, you can have a course kind of course map of solar, uh, potential. It's not necessarily doing a daily, uh, uh how much it's going to be on a daily basis, but on a, a daily average, you can get that number or even a yearly average, you can get that number. So, so we can do it for cities or locations. And then um, the idea is this is a solution and banks can then uh, help install solar uh, uh, installations based on where the potential is high. So that's one example of how they can use their money for good. Um, so that, that those, we're looking at climate solutions mainly from you know resources like drawdown and, and regeneration and so forth and seeing how geospatial data can enable financing of those solutions. That's the end goal. Wow. I didn't realize that satellites, this may be, I mean, you can obviously tell this is not my wheelhouse of expertise at all, because I didn't know satellites could even capture that much information like mm -hmm. yes. It's crazy. The amount of data that we have and the amount of data that we could use, it's, it's just mind blowing. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, and thankfully this technology is available, right? Like this is right. This is something that people that y'all are already doing and that like we don't have to wait for someone to invent this. Like we have the technology to adapt is what I'm hearing. We do. We absolutely do. In fact, I think uh, this resource called Project Regeneration, that's a book as well as a website, regeneration.org. They have like literally the most comprehensive, uh, you know, set of climate solutions we already have and we can do. We really do need a uh, financing of those um, to be implemented on a large scale and implemented wisely without impacting other social issues and impacting people who, you know, who, who live in poverty. We, we don't want them to be at odds with each other. So, so it's a delicate balance, but yeah, agreed. Hmm. So you're also with an organization, Common Engine, is that correct? Yeah, that's the startup I work for, Climate Engine, right? Perfect. So can you tell us more about the mission of Climate Engine and and what their role is in, in, in the climate crisis and how are they trying to advocate for, for change? Yeah, like where are y'all based? And like, is uh, so, it's just hearing more about like the just, organization itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned most of the things, you know, like the climate risk part and the um, uh, how, how the finance is impacting the environment and so forth. But essentially, Climate Engine's mission is to uh, go from science to finance. So so we develop earth insights for economic resilience and climate resilience, and it's data driven. So geospatial data driven insights um, to one, support financial and operational resilience for our planet, but also um, finance and en enable the financing of climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and all of this using the best science available and using the best data available that we have. Um, so, so that's, we, we are a science focused and data driven organization. And as far as where we're based, the headquarters are in um, Ottawa, Canada, 
but it's a remote team of currently just i believe 12 people <laughs> and and um it's it's it, i i'm the only one working from huntsville um a couple are in california a few are in canada so so and you know ones in boston so so yeah it were spread out but um it's a it's a very small but really great group of people i didn't realize it was only 12 of y'all i'm picturing like a yeah. massive organization doing this data work it, it sounds like that but no it's just <laughs> it's just a lean 12, team yeah 12 people just saving the world casually i'm like i'm <laughs> right but i'm i'm so proud that you're in Huntsville, Alabama. Like, I just want to yell. I'm not even like a Bama fan or anything, but I just want to yell Roll Tide from the top of my lungs because like, <laughs> Roll Tide. No, I mean, because it's like, hell yeah, this dude is in mm -hmm. Alabama. This dude is working on these solutions and mm -hmm. working with this technology. I think it's just, it's, it gives me hope personally, you yeah. know? And sure. glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, Marisha and I, we're more on the organizing and environmental justice. Mm -hmm. front. Sure, um, and that's super, super important. And yeah, I think so. So the thing is that climate engine and even just climate tech startups in general, we work a lot with the data and tech side and stuff. But all of this wouldn't wouldn't matter if the actions are not implemented on the ground right. and actually happening. So we need, you know. Both are equally important. I'd say the groundwork is more important too, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Hold on Super. now, let's not, let's not take away that data is, is <laughs> definitely a key part in, sure. <laughs> in what we do and how we go about how we do what mm -hmm. we do. Yeah. Well, the data backs up what we're saying too, right? Right. Yeah, sure, and, sure. And there's also what's, What's interesting about your work in particular is that you're showing these banks how their pockets are hurting if they yeah. stay investing in this. Um, right. And I, I, so I pulled a quote directly from y'all's website and you, you mm -hmm. echoed it a little bit in your mission statement, but I want to say it here and yeah. have it be grounding us. But it says, we are in a period of unprecedented environmental change. The economic impacts of climate change are happening now and they will only get worse. A more mm -hmm. sustainable future depends on transforming this data into actionable insights for financial and operational resilience. <laughs> climate mm -hmm. Engine, this is just so casual, it's like, whatever. Anyway, Climate Engine provides the world's best available Earth insights to help organizations build economic resilience to climate change. Wow. So how does... What kind of technology are y'all using? I know satellites are involved, but what all what right. all does this kind of look like? And how does technology play a role in climate financing? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, so, so it involves several things. Um, we obviously use satellite data, um, like I mentioned, and then we use this platform called Google Earth Engine. It's different from Google Earth or Google Maps. It's Google Earth Engine has uh, many many hundreds of satellite data sets on google cloud so that means you can use that data without downloading a single byte of that data you can use it on this platform google earth engine and we prototype and create algorithms using this uh using data so for example any organization can pull up and give you um temperature precipitation all of that is just calculated by the satellites and and sent as a or uploaded onto the cloud as a product. Um, so making maps of those basic variables are relatively easy. But what we do is we use those data and on top of it, we create risk maps. Um, we create forecasts of um, climate hazards like floods, fires, droughts, um, extreme heat, which is not that simple. That that requires more um, like that requires more science and more algorithm development and validation and so forth. So, so we add science on top of the existing data sets, which have the basic climate and environmental variables. And so, yeah, Google Earth Engine. And then um, we operationalize all of our algorithms using Google Clouds, uh, Google, Google Cloud um, and Python. We create pipelines that um, run this code on the cloud to create active or static uh, maps of, of uh, these risks. Um, so, yeah. 
I hope that answers the question. So, so yeah, we use Google Earth Engine, Google Cloud, and Python um, code to enable uh, these data-driven platforms. And then all of this data that's created, we can just show it on a, a platform. We have a person who creates custom websites as needed for a client. And um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what we do. And we're coming out with a new platform called Spatiify that's really new and just publicly announced last month. Um, so Spatiify stands for Spatial Finance, and that's going to have these different modules of climate risk, um, emissions, biodiversity risk, and so forth. And that's going to um, combine all of our many um, offerings into one single platform. Wow. What, when are y'all trying to publish this platform? Because when this episode's out, we'll probably be publishing later. So like we, okay. we may want to okay. hype that up. Okay. Um, I, I believe the release date will be soon within the next three to four weeks. I don't know an exact date, but, uh, but by next month, I would say we will have an initial uh, yeah, uh, publish. That's so exciting. Good. Well, okay. I'm going to ask a personal question. And uh, sure. for once, I'm actually getting off of scripts, <laughs> Marisha. Yeah. I, awesome. How does it feel? Because I imagine you're looking at these images of like, honestly, climate devastation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I imagine mm -hmm. that you see a lot when it comes to looking at these images and these maps. Does that weigh, like, how does that feel? feel to kind of how does it feel to look at those images because it's kind of it's not casual to be like i'm looking at the end of the world through this like image you know how does it mm. how does that feel i mean uh, yeah totally off-putting and it it feels sad to know that models predict you know th these things and and it feels um like we are sometimes fighting an uphill battle often, but but what gives me hope is that we're not the only ones fighting the good fight. Um, there are people all around the world, including yourselves, including many teams and organizations in the country and internationally who are committed in the fight against climate change and, and committed to implementing solutions. So while while looking at the data is definitely frustrating often and is definitely um a, a challenge personally sometimes what gives me hope is that the fact that we're working to to enable these good environmental stewardship related decisions good climate uh de decisions and we're using this data for banks to realize and enable climate adaptation and mitigation so that's what really drives me to just keep doing it and um yeah, so so I'm I'm just hopeful that you know people like ourselves are, are committed and and doing this work and um, especially our generation is really committed to climate solutions and environmental solutions. I know this story, Ankur. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much for yeah. coming and sharing all of these things. I mean, you've taught me so much, and I this is one reason why I love doing this podcast just having everyone come in all of our guests and just teach us some things that we don't even know that we don't even think about like yes we are in the same in the same work or working towards the same thing let me put it that way we're working towards the same thing but we're doing it in different ways so learning and just learning that oh my gosh all of these things just are aligning and we are all working towards the same goal it's just amazing thank you so much for just sharing what you do how you do it what what organizations and how your organizations work towards this and just like us you don't sleep for real although you said you do we know we know the truth <laughs> so thank you so uh, much for coming and sharing absolutely no thank you for having me and um really really grateful and happy to answer any other questions you may have or any anything you need to know yeah, oh, before you leave, we would like to ask, how can we get in touch with you? What are your social medias? Email if you want to share it. Sure. Um, so let's see. I have an Instagram account. It's a -ank, a -N -K Shaw, my last name, and then 13. So it's, uh, I'll just type it if you need. And then if you want to, um, I guess watch any videos or I, I create videos on how to get a climate job, how to 
or, or, or just climate issues, um, uh, plastic pollution and so forth. So if you're interested in, you know, educational videos, my YouTube channel currently, it's just my name, but, um, but it, it, I, I need to rebrand it. <laughs> But yeah, it's my name right now, Uncle Rasha. If you look it up, I'll, I'll send a link. You might have it. Um, yeah, you got to get a brand, man. You got to. I do. Yeah, seriously, seriously need a brand. Um, I like your your name, like Climate Justice Y'all. You know, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know who. I think Nina Morgan came up with that name, right? Nina? Oh, yeah. Okay. I know Nina, for sure. You know Nina? We all know each other, y'all. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, yeah. It is a <laughs> It's a small <laughs> world, but you know, thank you. You give me hope, and if since y'all you're on our side, dude, we're we're gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be just fine. <laughs> for sure. Thanks for being on our side. Thanks for choosing the good side. Thank you for having me on, and I really appreciate it. And yeah, if you ever need any, you know, data help or any anything at all, let me know. I'm here in Huntsville. Yeah. I'll drive to Huntsville. Don't worry about it. We're good. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Come on. <laughs> It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver? I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.